there is no shortage of um, resources today that are available for those who are married. But when it comes to singles, there are few resources that are available, especially ones that are biblically based, ones that will drive somebody to understand not just marriage, but singleness from a biblical perspective. There's a few resources. There's a great book that was published recently by a guy named Sam Alberry called Seven Myths About Singleness that is very helpful, but it's one of the few because those resources are few and far between. The church in general, at least my experience and those I've talked with, the church in general has, for some reason, exalted marriage, put it on a pedestal, and downplayed the concept of singleness. And the more I've learned about the Bible, the more I've learned just what an unbiblical approach it is to exalt one over the other. The Bible never considers one relationship status, married or single, as greater than or lesser than the other. Over the last few weeks in our series, Holy Sexuality, we've considered uh, sexual ethics from a biblical perspective in a variety of areas of life. We've considered it for those who are married. We've considered it for those who are same-sex attracted. We've considered it for those who have a disconnect between their body and mind, what we commonly call transgenderism or gender dysphoria. And we want to wrap up the series today by considering another group of folks, and that is those who are single. Both those who are single who would fall in the category of teenage, college age, or never married, and those who would be considered what some would call single again. So as we do that today, we're going to look at that from actually two different angles as we approach it. The first is going to be through the lens of sex, culture, and scripture. And then the second lens we're going to look at that through is um, the myth of singleness and completeness, something that's very prevalent in culture. So to do this, we're going to do something a little different than we normally do. Normally, we like to stay just in one text and kind of drill down on that. But we're actually going to be in two different texts today because, believe it or not, the Bible actually has a lot to say about the area of singleness. And so, both in the Old and the New Testaments. So, we're going to look at the first angle through the lens of the Old Testament, and then we're going to flip over to the New Testament for the second lens. So, if you are, um, have a Bible today, I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start there. And as we do that, let me say for those of you who are married, let me encourage you not to check out. Uh, there will be some principles here that I think will apply. And I'll be honest, uh, myself included, uh, early on, um, did not have a very biblical theology of singleness. My theology of singleness was shaped much more by culture than it was by Scripture. So even for those of you in here who are married, you may get to reshape your theology a little bit today if you have been shaped in some of the ways that I have. But we'll begin with that first lens, the lens of sex, culture, and Scripture. As we've discussed pretty much every week in every one of these topics that we have hit, it's very important to understand that the Bible should be the basis for our particular worldview, should be the basis for the sexual ethics that we hold. We saw a couple of weeks ago, for uh, example, we looked specifically uh, when I had the opportunity to share with you about transgenderism, we looked at Genesis chapter 1 and looked at how God created things. And one of the things that we mentioned was that, well, one of the things that we see in creation is that when God creates, he creates everything with a meaning, with an order, and with a purpose. And that just doesn't have to do with that particular topic that we discussed, but it's with all these topics that we talk about. And we see in Genesis chapter 2 that there is very much a meaning a purpose, and a design to sex and sexuality. So Genesis chapter 2, we're going to look at just a couple of verses toward the tail end of the creation story. Chapter 2 kind of drills down on that a little bit more in depth. But chapter 2, verses 22, sorry, verses 24 and 25 says this. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked and yet felt no shame. So here God creates Adam and then later creates a helpmate for Adam. Her name is Eve. And then we're told about what would be considered, what we would consider, I guess you would say, the healthy, holy, God-given definition for sex and sexuality. And that is one man, one woman in the context of marriage. That anything outside of that would be considered sinful, but anything within that boundary, within that definition of one man, one woman in the context of marriage, that in that 
definition within those boundaries that what we have in the act of sex is something that's beautiful, something that's bonding, something that's shameless. Despite the church often being accused, especially by culture, of being old-fashioned and prudish, and I've even heard the word repressive mentioned over the years when it comes to this area, when we look at such passages as this and when we see rather lengthy treatments in Scripture, such as the book of the Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, as some call it, what we find is that Christianity actually is not repressive, and it actually is not prudish, but actually Christianity, from a biblical perspective, the Bible has a very high view of sexuality. It's the opposite end of that spectrum. It's when we come to culture that, in contrast, we see that culture, though it claims to be very free in this area, that we find that culture is actually has a very low view of sex and sexuality. Through the lens of culture and Scripture, we are going to be hard-pressed to find two areas that are more opposed to each other than those two areas when it comes to this particular area of sex and sexuality. I jotted down this, this week and, and thinking through this, praying through this, working on this, jotted down a few areas where we see this opposing happen. Let me share with a few with you I jotted down. When it comes to culture, culture te- Um, Culture treats sex as something that's very common, something that's unholy. But Scripture treats it as something that is sacred and something that is holy. Culture treats sex as something to be happened in any bed, in any situation. But Scripture teaches that sex is something to be reserved only for the marriage bed. Culture teaches that sex is something with no consequences, regardless of how it happens, whether inside marriage or outside marriage or who it happens with. But Scripture teaches us that sex is something that has a beautiful meaning, something that has purpose, but something that can be abused and something that can even be dangerous when it's outside that God-given definition of one man, one woman in the context of marriage. Culture treats sex as something that is actually a marriage killer, but Scripture actually teaches that sex is something that is a marriage enhancer. Culture teaches that sex is something that must be experienced to be fulfilled. It is a necessary part of humanity and the human experience. But Scripture teaches that we will only find fulfillment inside of Christ. Just simply looking around at culture, it's not hard to find examples of this. Movies, TV shows, things that you stream give us examples of this all the time. You'll be really hard-pressed to find a movie or a TV show from the last couple of decades that has a couple that's dating that aren't involved sexually in that dating relationship. One of, the, one of the golden rules in Hollywood, one of the no-nos that you don't do for a TV show, one of the unwritten rules, but is widely regarded, I have found out in doing culture research, is that the sure way to take a hit TV show and kill it is to take the dating couple and have them get married. You can find numerous instances in culture where TV shows were a hit for, for years, and then the sexual tension supposedly is lost between the dating couple after they get married and the ratings begin to tank. And this isn't something that just applies simply to TV shows. We see this in movies. We see that what we refer to sometimes as innocence is something that is not to be cherished, but that innocence is something that is to be lost, something to be given away as quickly as possible lest you end up like Steve Carell in a movie like The 40-Year-Old Virgin where he's basically a punchline because he's not had any sexual experiences by the time he reaches 40 years old. Music is no different. There was a a hit song by uh, country superstar Alan Jackson a few years ago where the chorus says, living on love, buying on time, living with somebody, uh, living without somebody, nothing's worth a dime. In other words, if I don't have anybody in my life, it doesn't matter what else I have, it doesn't have any value. And it's not just the world that thinks this way. I've discovered over time that you'll find lots of examples in Christian circles where that happens as well. Just a couple of months ago, I was streaming an album, a fairly new album by a Christian artist, and he made the comment in that song, and I wrote it down so I didn't get it wrong. He makes the comment in that song where he says, um, what good is a crib with nobody in it? A crib meaning a home. In other words, he's saying, what good is it to have a home if you don't have somebody to share it with, that all those things are worthless? 
So what we see is that for many in the church, we've been discipled sometimes in this area much more by culture than we have by scripture. I ran across just this week a new uh, research report by Pew Research, which does a lot of work in church circles, does a lot of surveys, a lot of research, very reliable information, where a recent survey that, that they did showed that just over half of all those who claim to be church-going believers said that casual sex is wholly acceptable, that there's nothing wrong with treating sex as something that's casual, whether you're single or even if you are married. In today's culture, the thought of celibacy, the thought of showing self-restraint for any reason for somebody who is single is as weird as a cat being a part of the Westminster dog show. There are two things that don't go together, two things that don't fit. For those of us as Christians, our lens is to be Scripture. Our lens is not to be the lens of culture. The call for those who are single is a call to holiness in all areas, including the area of sexuality. Can that be difficult? Absolutely, it can be difficult. But Jesus says the Christian path is the one that is the narrow road and the one that is hard and is difficult at times. It's the world that gives us a different definition of that. So difficult though it may be, what we see from this in Genesis chapter 2, from this definition that we're given of how sex is supposed to work, one man, one woman, in the context of marriage, that there is a meaning and a design and a purpose to sex and sexuality, regardless of the message that we're told regularly in culture. The second angle that we want to look at this from is the idea of singleness and the, what I would call singleness and the myth of completeness. So I invite you to flip over from the Old Testament to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in the New Testament. This is a passage that Paul dives into very deeply on both those, for the, both those who are married and for those who are single. It's obvious that there is a what I would call a head-on collision between Christianity and culture in their worldviews on what we could call sex in the single life. However, the clash is not so obvious sometimes when it comes to the issue of identity for those who are single versus those who are married. Too often, I've discovered, even in my own life as I've shared, that what we find with church and culture on this issue is a close alignment, not a theology that is separate from each other. You may, remove, uh, you may remember, even if you never saw it, you may be familiar with, at least in part, the movie Jerry Maguire from the 90s. That's a movie that, because of a couple of catchphrases, invaded pop culture in a really big way. It was on t-shirts and coffee mugs, some of these catchphrases that were out and about. The one that is best known and that was uh, used for years and years, even to the point where it became a punchline, is, well, is the line, show me the money. You may remember that happening. And people talking about it in commercials, you had it used all over the place. This idea of show me the money. That's one that thankfully has sort of regressed over time and you don't hear a whole lot anymore. But there was a, another catchphrase that came out of that that was based uh, in this idea that lends itself to the myth. It's still uttered in some places and it um, is still something that is believed even though it's a very unbiblical idea. And it's a very, I would even say, dangerous idea. In the movie, Tom Cruise's character, who's the star of the movie, who plays Jerry Maguire, uh, begins to fall in love with Renee Zellweger's character. And of course, as it often goes in these kinds of stories, whether it's a Hallmark movie or whether it's a regular movie or whether it's a TV show, right? The guy messes it up and they ended up breaking up. But at the end of the movie, he rushes to the house where her character is at and he gives her this big speech about how he has grown as a person, how she has helped him become a better person, how she has shown him the error of his ways. And then he utters the line that seemed to make many people swoon back in the day. And the line was simply three words. He uttered the lines, you complete me. It's a phrase that you may have heard or may be a little bit familiar with. It's not an original sentiment. It's been around a long time. You can study history and even philosophy all the way back to the time of Plato and actually find that notion. But what that movie and that catchphrase actually helped do was it gave words to this idea for those both inside and outside the church. This idea that for people who are single, they're not whole. That for people who are single, they're lacking something. That for people who are single, they are not complete until they find that, that mythical soulmate, the unicorn that's out there somewhere waiting for them. 
As, as I mentioned, you, you, you hear this in music all the time, both in Christian and non-Christian circles. It's a, it's a theology that just saturates everything. Sam Alberry, who I mentioned earlier, wrote the book Seven Myths About Singleness, um, had a couple of really great insights in that book as I was reading it a few weeks ago. One of the things he says is this. He says, many, in our default, many of our default settings see singleness as a deficiency. It's important to note that Alberry is writing from the point of someone who is single. Uh, Alberry is a believer. He is a pastor on staff at a church, has been for a long time, but has also been very upfront that he deals with same-sex attraction, that that's not an attraction that he wants, but it's an attraction that he has for whatever reason. And so instead of acting on those impulses, he has chosen to be celibate and to be single in honor of uh, the call in the gospel. So he's writing from someone who, who experienced this as a single. And to prove the point, he uses terminology that we use in our culture. He says, single people are referred to as unmarried, but we never think of married people as unsingle. That was a nice observation. His point is simply that singleness is often couched in terms that are much more negative than they are positive, something that's lacking or something that's missing, whereas the terminology we often have about marriage is one that leads to fulfillment or something like an end goal has been reached. For those who think in such terms, Paul offers us a corrective in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, a passage where he deals both with marriage and singleness. It's a really fascinating passage. It's a rather lengthy passage. We don't have time to look at all of it, but Paul speaks directly to those who are married and to those who are single in this passage. And he has a specific word in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, we want to look at this morning. He says this, I wish that all people were as I am. Now, if you're not familiar with Paul, Paul was single. There's some debate about whether or not Paul had been married at one time, and if he had been married, if his wife had died, or if she had left him when he uh, left the Jewish faith and became a Christian. It's not really known, it's debated, but the point is, Paul was very familiar with singleness. So he says, I wish that all were as I am, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, and another person that gift. So here in this passage, we see Paul describes singleness as a gift. He places those who are married and those who are single on equal footing. He says both are a gift in their own way. Neither is a burden, neither is a curse, neither is something to simply endure for a season until the opposite season comes along. The idea that marriage is something that's needed to complete a person is a very unbiblical idea. Paul talks about that here in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7, where he describes singleness as a gift, and he also describes marriage as a gift. We also have the example of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, who talks specifically about those who um, sexually are not able to perform that and those who can but choose to be celibate for a variety of reasons. Jesus uplifts both of those things in that passage in Matthew chapter 19. And when we look at some of the characters that we're familiar with in the Bible, what we find is they're not considered deficient because they were single. You have the disciples who, as far as we know, only one of them, Peter, was married. The rest most likely were not. Paul was single. And Jesus himself was someone who was single. So what we see is that those who are single are not less than, they're not greater than, they're on equal footing with those who are married. I was, read, read a, a blog this week by a guy, a pastor, who is single, and he was dealing with this uh, issue with his friends and people in his congregation who were always pushing him to get married, trying to convince him that that was what God had for him. They didn't treat singleness as the gift that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. And he said this as part of his reflection in his blog. He said, uh, history's uh, most complete person never had sex and never got married. If singleness is deficient, then so was Jesus Christ. To be sure, we are all incomplete in some way, shape, or form. Every person in this room, every person joining us online is incomplete. And we are in need of a certain relationship, a relationship that will make us whole, a relationship that will complete us. But that relationship can only be found in Jesus. It's not going to be found in our spouse 
It's not going to be found in somebody we work with. It's not going to be found in a friend. It's not going to be found in our, in our kids, for those of us who have kids. To expect someone to do what only God can do is unfair to that person. It puts a burden on them that they cannot fulfill. It sets that person and that particular relationship up for fail, failure. Marriage, Paul is very clear and the experience is very clear. Marriage has its advantages. It also has its disadvantages. Singleness has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. But whether married or single, the fact remains that there is no one and nothing that can make us complete and whole in the way that we need it most than through having a relationship with Jesus. That's the only way for that to happen. So what do we do in light of these two particular areas? How do we respond? Well, a couple of thoughts I jotted down. Number one, whether you're single or you are married, it is extremely important to be sure that when we are discipled in the areas of sex and sexuality and relationships, that we are discipled by scripture, not by culture. Because again, scripture and culture, especially in this area, are going to always be on polar opposite ends of the spectrum in what they teach and in what they believe. One is going to lead us in the way that God wants us to go. The other is going to lead us in the way that God doesn't want us to go because they're two completely different value systems. And for those who are married, be sure you have a really good theology of singleness, for lack of a better phrase. Be sure that we understand relationships as God created them to work and that we see relationships and people as God sees them, not how we think it should be. Someone who's single is just as complete and just as whole in some ways as those who are married. Again, the deficiency comes in in more of a spiritual realm, and Jesus is the only one who can fill that. And for those who are married, one of the things I've heard from single people over the years is the caution to be sure that for those who are married especially, we don't make an idol out of marriage. That can show up in a couple of ways. It's the grandma or the uncle who is always pushing that one single person at the family reunion, right? Asking that question, when are you going to get married? You see them for the first time in two years and your first question is, tell me who you're dating. Tell me about your dating life, right? Out of concern, yes, because you love, yes, but sometimes it's because whether we realize it or not, we have made an idol out of marriage. We made that the end goal, not realizing that sometimes singleness, even if it's for a season, can be a gift, to not treat people who are single like they're simply just biding their time and they're coasting until they can find their soulmate and find the right person and get married and then their real life can begin. To be cautious of such a thing. John Chapman, who is another guy who is single, much like Sam Alberry, but for John's single for a different reason, but he's a single uh, pastor and he's also in Arthur. He wrote this about some friends as well who were constantly bringing up to him the idea of marriage and that he should be married. He said, it would have been a great help to me if they had read the Bible. <laughs> Interesting. In other words, if they had a biblical theology of singleness instead of a cultural theology of singleness. So for those who are married, it's also important to realize that loneliness can be really difficult and a real issue for those who are single. That can be a challenge. Invite folks who are single into your world. Invite them to be part of your community, not because you pity them, not because you think they're lacking in anything or because they need a handout from you, but because what we're called to do in Scripture, for those of us who are believers, is that we're called to do life together, regardless of somebody's relationship status, that we're called to be in community with each other. And also, truthfully, to realize that for many in here today and many joining us online, who are married, who wear a ring, so to speak, that there may come a day where you don't wear that ring any longer. Rarely do those who uh, get married end up dying at the same time. And as you, you know as well as I do, divorce is common among all age groups. So just the fact that someone is married today doesn't mean they would be married a year from now or two years from now for a variety of reasons. So community not based just on relationship status, but a community based on the fact that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are part of the family of God, is an important theology to have, an important thing to understand, that both those who are single and those who are married are in community with each other. 
Singleness, singleness for those, uh, or loneliness for those who are single can be a real challenge. It's important f- to be aware of that from a community aspect. And for those who are single, realize Paul's words here. Culture doesn't treat singleness necessarily as a gift. But it's important to understand that Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that singleness is a gift. And Paul's encouragement is to use it wisely. In this passage, Paul writes about that. Jesus also writes about that and discusses how singleness allows people to serve the kingdom in a way that married folks sometimes are not able to serve the kingdom. For those who are single, you may desire to marry at some point, and that, the Bible says, is a godly desire and a good desire. You may not want to be single forever. You may even be on the lookout now for who your potential spouse may be, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Scripture does say that for those who are single, regardless of if you're looking to get married or not, there are advantages to that from a kingdom perspective as far as opportunities to use that singleness wisely. The encouragement in Scripture is, even though that is a godly desire, to be sure and don't compromise on that Genesis 2 boundaries that we saw of one man, one woman, to be wise of that, but to also make use of the time of singleness and realize that if God has somebody out there for you in his time, he will bring them together. On Thursday, I actually did a wedding here in Hot Springs out at Garvin Gardens for a couple who they'd been single their whole life. They were 41 years old and getting married for the first time. And part of what I was, met with them early on and visiting with them, her prayer as she got older was that God would give her somebody before she was 40. I think she began ramping those years up as the years went on, right? And she even said, she said, I began to get discouraged and think that God didn't have somebody for me. But it was interesting talking to her family and meeting them at the reception after the wedding on Thursday. One of the things that one of the family members said as we were having dinner after the wedding was that she knew that the, the, the lady knew that the guy was the person because she said she doesn't treat dating casually, right? She had protected her heart. She had protected her mind until she found the right person. But when she thought she had found the right person, she went in whole hog in that relationship, if you will. And she said, I knew that she had met the right guy at that time, even though at the time when they met and began dating, they were 38 years old. So sometimes it takes a little while for whatever reason, it takes a little while. But the encouragement in scripture is to continue on on the path that God has you waiting for the right person that is there. For those who are single, whether you have never been married or whether you are what has come to be termed single again, either because of death or because of divorce, seek that contentment. John talked in one of the previous sermons in this series out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the chapter just before this one, where Paul talks about singleness as a gift. And Paul's directive there is to remember that for those who are believers, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we're called to honor God with our body. And specifically, the context of 1 Corinthians 6 is in the area of, of sex and sexuality. Again, there are advantages and disadvantages to singleness. And one of the difficulties is the call to live out a holy sexuality in the midst of a culture which encourages the exact opposite, that treats sex as something that's uncommon and something that is unholy and treats, honestly, treats celibacy and restraint until marriage like leprosy, something to be avoided at all costs, something you don't want to get anywhere near. But there will come a time where if God has someone for you, he will provide that person. And dating is a challenge for those who are singles, whether you've always been single or whether you're single again, because it seems like dating and sexuality just simply go together in our culture. Again, the idea of someone dating but not being sexually involved is a really foreign idea in our culture. And that's an expectation that can easily spill onto those who are believers. And so there is the caution there to guard everything and to understand from Genesis chapter 2 that God-given definition of sexuality, one man, one woman, in the context of marriage. And finally, it's important to remember in all things, whether married or single, as we wrap up this entire series, to remember that there is grace. That when those boundaries have been transgressed or even currently being transgressed, whether it's with a screen or whether it's with a real-life person, that there is grace and forgiveness for those who confess and repent sin 
for those who turn to Christ and those who look to him for wholeness, completeness, completeness, and for salvation. That to understand that in that relationship with Jesus, we have been made whole and complete, that he is the only one who can do that. And part of that entails finding grace and finding forgiveness in the times when we find ourselves outside of those boundaries of Genesis chapter two. That there is nothing, nothing that can't be forgiven, nothing that can't be made new, nothing that can't be restored under the blood of Christ in the crucifixion and the resurrection. All things can be made new. Pray with me. Father, we are grateful for the gift of grace. We're grateful for the gift of relationships, friendships, family relationships, community relationships, and marriage. So as we wrap up the series today in just totality, we're grateful for the things we've been able to talk about, some of the hard issues we've been able to talk about from a biblical perspective, but also with much grace and compassion because of what you have done, Jesus. So I pray as we just enter into a time of um, reflection and wrapping this up, that your spirit will speak to us. I pray that your spirit will move however you want over these next few minutes. If there's someone we need to pray for, something we need to confess, Lord, give us the courage and the boldness to respond however you have for us today. But may these next few moments be a sacred time of interaction with your spirit. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We want to enter to a, a time of response or action to use our word that, that you can text. However you'd like to respond today, we'll have ministers up front. If you're here in the room, if it's church membership, baptism, you have questions about coming to know Christ, you're beginning that journey and have some things you want to discuss or some way that we could pray for you as a church staff, we'd be glad to meet you up front in that. Or maybe you just want to spend some time thinking through whatever God may have for you in the relationships that you have, whether married or single. Maybe there's somebody you want to pray for or maybe you want to spend some time praying for yourself. Maybe we'll invite you to stand in just a minute, but maybe you just need to sit and pray. That's fine as well. If you're in the chat, or if you're uh, online, you can for sure text the word ACTION to the number 94000. There'll be a variety of ways that you can respond on there, and we'll be in touch uh, very shortly with you uh, after the services today. We'll be in touch this afternoon. But do want to invite you to stand, unless you feel led to sit and pray. I invite you to stand and sing along with us. We'll have ministers up front if you would like to respond in some way today. We'll be glad to welcome you. <laughs> 